Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the April 25th, 2023 Planning Commission special meeting to order. The Planning Commission is holding hybrid meetings. Members of the public can attend the meeting in person or observe the meeting on Zoom online by visiting www.cityofarcata.org and following the live meetings link at the bottom of the city's homepage or on the city's YouTube channel. If you are attending remotely, please be aware that the Zoom feed provides the closest to real-time stream. If you rely on the other feeds and you wish to make comments, please be aware of the time lag on those feeds. The first item on our agenda is the land acknowledgement. The city of Arcata acknowledges that the lands we are located on are the unceded ancestral lands of the Wiat tribe. The land that Arcata rests on is known in the Wiat language as Gudene, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. Past actions by local, state, and federal governments removed the Wiat and other indigenous peoples from the land and threatened to destroy their cultural practices. The city of Arcata acknowledges the Wiat community, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement seeks to aid in dismantling the legacy narratives of settler colonialism. And roll call is next. I just want to give a brief welcome to our new commissioner, Joel Yodowitz. Thanks, Joel. Great to be back to full strength here. Uh, David, will you call roll? Yeah, Commissioner Lehman? Here. Commissioner Simmons? Here. Uh, commissioner Mayer? Here. Commissioner Yodowitz? Here. Uh, commissioner Figueroa? Here. Vice Chair Tagney? Here. And Chair Davies? Here. Uh, on the city staff end, we are joined today by Community Development Department staff, Director David Loya and Senior Planner Joe Matier. Next up this evening, we will have public comment. During this time, people may make comments about items that are on the agenda. Except for the public hearing on the planning permit, which has specific planning law requirements for public comment, we will not be opening public comment on each item individually. If you have comments about items that are listed on our agenda today, except the Tuttle design review, please line up now behind the lectern. If you are here to speak on the design review permit application, I will be opening public comment for that item during the public hearing. If you are on Zoom and you wish to make oral communications on matters that are on today's agenda, please raise your hand by selecting the raise hand icon on the right side of your screen or by pressing star nine if you are calling in. For those on Zoom, when it is your turn to speak, the clerk will unmute you. Each speaker will have three minutes to comment. Feel free to state your name for the record. May we have the first speaker, please. Good evening, my name is Joanne McGarry and um, it's good to see you all. I totally appreciate your dedication to this cause uh, of our community. Um, I uh, walk here often and uh, three times now in a crosswalk, I almost got hit by a car. So as we discuss uh, general plan concepts in the future, and to be honest with you, I don't know specifically what on the general plan you're talking about today, but we've got to um, make this a less car focused community in whatever way possible you can do that so that we all can safely enjoy this town and also about buses i was able to take a bus up to an earth day celebration in mckinleyville but i was not able to get back on a bus because they don't run late enough um, and so we've got some really significant issues to make our town better and um, thank you Thank you for your comments, Joanne. I would like to cede my time to Fred Wise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one thing I'll mention as a small aside, uh, the um, Marin County 
form based code was given to us as an example in the packet. Uh, recently, the, after an eight hour meeting, the planning commissioners would not approve the housing element, voted it down six to one. The supervisors overrode that at, I think, what it was a seven hour meeting. So we're fortunate here to have three hour meetings. Um, and a, and a lack of that level of contention. Uh, on Saturday, I mentioned the three uh, aspects of product and perception and process. Um, one thing that concerns me in the infrastructure element of the general plan is that we're required to talk about fire protection, police schools or parks, but you actually don't give direction in these things. Uh, the gateway plan is defined as creating perhaps 500 housing apartment units, maybe 3,500. It's a huge range. Uh, Director Loy has told you that 3,500 is mathematically possible. I believe it's mathematically impossible. So why even talk about it? Uh, as we've seen in the last couple of months, uh, with the university getting their 300 motel rooms, talk of a barge hotel, if 500 apartments were to sprout up suddenly automatically, they'd be filled more or less instantly. But who is going to tell the police, fire, people run the parks, the plan, these things, that there's going to be 1,000 or 2,000 people here? How's that going to happen? In parks, uh, we know where Stewart School Park is. That's a, a walking distance. All the other parks are a little difficult, especially for children, to get to. I propose that the city employ one of their staff or perhaps um, uh, Mark Andre, I haven't asked him to uh, write a grant, raise a million dollars, and buy a block and make it a park. It would make a huge difference in the success of the Gateway Plan. Now, in terms of uh, process and perception, uh, we have um, the uh, schedule, a timeline from this packet. There's no date on it. I'd like to see a date on that so we know whether it's updated or recent or not. And on a much larger issue, um, at your Saturday meeting, uh, at, towards the end of the meeting, as you know, uh, you brought up the idea of providing a time for people to come and speak about uh, rezoning issues. Uh, it was a three-minute conversation. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube or read the transcription. It's very clear what you said. It went very quickly because you all agreed that it's going to be on the Thursday meeting. But the Thursday meeting agenda right now does not include that. Commissioner Simmons said it should go first. It's not first, it's not there. On Monday, uh, we got a e-notification, went out to the city. Uh, it didn't mention rezoning. It mentions uh, a euphemism of land use map amendment. I think this is a huge disservice to the public. Uh, when I say huge, I mean huge. I wrote to uh, city manager, community development director, and yourselves, the mayor and vice mayor, about this on Monday, without proper notification, who's going to come? What's gonna happen? Now you've gotten emails, of course, and you know, you know the disputed parcels, it's not new, but still, uh, this is really contrary to what we're trying to do here, both in terms of the process and in terms of what it conveys to the public. I think every day, someone reaches out to me and says, what's going on here? How do I fit in? What do I say? And I tell them to get involved immediately, you know? But when this kind of e-notification goes out, uh, let me look up the title here. It, yeah, the euphemism is, the commission will consider the draft land use map amendments. I think any member of the public who doesn't know what that means is not gonna think it's about rezoning. The, um, my question is, are we gonna talk about rezoning on Thursday is it going to be in the agenda? And is another e-notification going to go out? Um, I hate to be so harsh about this stuff, but this is really different from what you've been promoting. You know, you, 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 in, in, in recent months, you've been a cohesive group working on getting things done. This is not that. Thanks. Thanks for your comments, Fred. So um, good evening, um, I, uh, Patricia Cambianica. Uh, 
So um, at the end of the last um, city uh, planning commissioner commission meeting, um, not the special meeting, but I guess the previous special meeting, um, commi uh, the um, chair Davies um, kind of pushed back. He's you know he's feeling obligated to push back um, about public comment and kind of our frustration that he noticed um, and was said it was a critical part of what. You, you do to listen to us and it was important to you and um, I would like to um, ask you to show us and not tell us that we haven't really seen it or felt it um, at these so-called special meetings as like tonight I know Saturday was a true special meeting but it's the same place the same day and you just schedule it a half an hour earlier so that you could go home earlier and um, I and it, what it does is it eliminates um, the community being able to talk uh, with each business item after each business item before they go to a vote. And um, so that's one way we're kind of feeling left out. Um, we're not able to discuss anything um, at the end of every business item. Um, another one is, you know, in the agendas, uh, and the minutes from the previous, um, there's no summary of what the community has said. It's going to action minutes. So I think there's just a tally of who spoke, but not in, there's not even a mention of what they spoke about. Um, we heard that there was a desire for more diversity to come into the city. The city has done nothing to bring in more diversity um, and of voices. Um, they've done like a token, like I think there was one and they had, you know, they had one person that spoke Spanish, and that's all I really know of. And um, we were called, you know, the, the people who show up were called rich white property owners from the community development director. Um, so it, that doesn't really encourage people to come. The city has done um, almost, you know, they had the two-day open house, and they didn't compile any of that information. It's two days, the, the, the community came out. None of that was compiled. They overwhelmingly asked for three to four stories to stop, and that be the, our limit. Um, we weren't heard. There's no reflection of what the community wanted, any of that two-day um, open house. 40%, um, you stated 40% of the last night meeting was um, turned over to public comment. That's great. I wish there was more of that. Um, I've heard that they wish there were more people come. Um, the community sits prominently on the top of the city's organizational chart. It's this community that comes first. So anyways, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, hello to staff and commissioners. Um, James Becker, I believe tonight it sounds like, but we just never know until things get started, that eventually you'll be making recommendations on circulation and also on solar shadowing. Um, just want to remind you that there has been a lot of discussions on the subject via uh, meetings and workshops. You know, please remember siting, setbacks, stepbacks related to existing structures. This will allow to maximize solar panel exposure. And there has been discussion also about microgrids. So I just want to let you know that our Devon Cottage will be involved in both of those. And, you know, I would really just like to see that, you know, I mean, in, in the big picture, you know, we are trying to, um, you know, incorporate all those things. And that's what we've been sold on. Um, you know, and then just revisiting L Street. Um, going back to my notes. I'm just getting a little tired of writing new things. Um, I just want you to remember that if you, you know, as far as what's being offered here with L Street is the claim that it's going to be, the park would be accommodated by, uh, you know, allowing for um, easements being uh, offered out by the new developments. And, you know, that's just purely if it happens and you're trading off existing unspoiled corridor for the possibility of privately owned public spaces. And I don't really think that's acceptable. I would recommend that these spaces could be further enhanced the existing park if they do happen. Um, and then the detriment of not preserving the existing right of ways is first further exacerbated by gateway policy GA7I, no net loss of class one trail system in general of the total current lineal footage, footage of the class one trails in the plan area, even if the current facilities are, must be realigned and relocated to other areas within the route. If implementing the realignment of the roadways 
impacts the existing class one trail rails trail facility within the L Street right of way, design and construct a new trail in another location within the plan area. If implementing the realignment of the roadway impacts the existing class one trail rails to trail facility within the L Street right of way, design and construct a new class one trail in another location. Um, in limited circumstances, the city may retain the discretion to allow applicants to demonstrate removal or relocation of the trail sections and would improve the active transportation or active conductivity, access and conductivity. I know that's obviously going to be purely subjective, which is, I mean, things that we're trying to avoid here, right? This is supposed to be objective standards. Um, this language would permit private developers to realign L Street and move the trail. And I don't think that should be in the hands of them. I think that should be decided long before. And, you know, my vote is for preserving the Greenway and the L Street corridor. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anybody else that would like to speak from the audience here? Is there anyone on Zoom? We have three on Zoom. Um, we did experience some sort of a technical glitch, so um, I lowered everyone's hand. So if you're online, I'm just going to ask you to speak in order. And um, uh, let's see. Go ahead, Bob and or Suzanne. <coughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, let's see, is our camera supposed to be on? I guess not. Um, so we are, are uh, we want to address the the first item on the agenda, the, the tree removal. We, we are the closest neighbors to uh, Andrew Tuttle's project, uh, which we wholeheartedly support. So, so Bob, Bob, I'm sorry, there's going to be an opportunity to speak on the project in just a moment. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's what I was wondering. So okay. do I raise my hand again? Uh, I'll, I'll consider your hand raised. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone online that would like to speak Go to matters on the agenda other than the Tuttle design review? That's what we're looking for now. Go ahead, Colin. Good evening, commissioners. This is Colin Fisk, executive director of CRTP, the Coalition for Responsible Transportation Priorities. Um, Regarding the building height and shading, we just want to reiterate uh, CRTP's position that taller buildings are necessary to provide the levels of density that are required to support walkability, bikeability, and high quality public transit. And just to ask that any measures you may take to mitigate shading concerns, that you be careful um, you know, not to excessively reduce the densities uh, allowed below those that, that can support uh, those critical amenities. Regarding the public safety element, uh, we would ask that you add a policy that commits to working with the fire district to jointly investigating purchasing smaller fire trucks um, in order to reduce the perceived need for bigger and less safe streets, which would be designed solely to facilitate fire access, noting that smaller, more maneuverable trucks are already in use in many cities. Uh, and finally, also in the public safety element, we think it's critical to acknowledge uh, the data that's available that shows nationwide, statewide, um, that there are severe and persistent uh, disparities, uh, racial disparities in traffic stops and also in outcomes of traffic stops. Um, and therefore, we think that the city should commit to transitioning to uh, unarmed uh, staff enforcing traffic uh, citations as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Go ahead, Jane. Oops. Sorry, go ahead, Jane. Jane, we can't hear you. You appear to be muted. Okay, I'll try again. We can hear you now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, this is Jane Woodward, and I want to thank you for managing to try to absorb and respond to all the policies proposed both in the Gateway Plan and the overall general plan and the land use element. It's a prodigious task, including for the public, by the way. Uh, 
I've gonna hit a number of topics because you may be dealing with a number of topics. I want to remind you the staff have not yet laid out a plan for L Street as a linear park so that the Commission and City Council can actually consider it as an alternative to a one-way L Street. I suggest it would be useful to incorporate the KL Street couplet as an implementation measure rather than as a goal and not to anticipate that it will take 30 years to occur. Staff, city staff appear to want to be able to take action now. Two, I want to remind you that you have not yet scheduled a meeting to discuss the implications of sea level rise for intensive residential building in the coastal zone and the gateway area subject to sea level rise. And the legal and financial implications of failing to take sea level rise properly into account. Three, more importantly, you will be discussing the infrastructure and public facilities and public safety elements tonight that include policies on fire hazards, potential flooding hazards, and se seismic hazards, all of which are addressed in very general terms. Since the city claims to have specific information based on studies, it would be useful for the Planning Commission to request that staff provide specific information for how these issues are applicable to the gateway area. For example, what are the what, where are the faults? Are the soils there vulnerable to liquefaction? When will sea level rise affect areas north of Samoa Boulevard? Is the new gateway zoning code going to require builders to elevate their structures in anticipation of flooding issues? Has the city planned for moving the wastewater treat, waste treatment plant and associated infrastructure, and if so, to what possible locations? And what is actually being done for fire safety? Who's going to pay to protect the planned mid-level story buildings? What's the, what's the status of discussions with Cal Poly Humboldt? In terms of climate adaptation, what is the city actually doing? What's the status of Arcata's climate action plan? These are just a few of the questions I'd like city staff and the Planning Commission to address. For more information, the more information you have, the better decisions you can make. I hope you can take the time to adequately address these issues and put them in the bike rack so that you do, do get to them. Thank you for your consideration and all your work. This is tough. Thanks for your comments, Jane. We have no more uh, commenters on Zoom. All right, thank you for your comments. We do appreciate everyone's participation and input. We will now move to item three, business items. We have three business items this evening. Uh, the first business item is to approve design review and tree removal permit for total residential development on vacant property located on Union Street between 12th and 13th Streets File number 222034-DRTRP. Do any commissioners have ex parte communications to disclose? I would just like to acknowledge that I'm a neighbor of this project. Um, however, I've discussed it with staff and don't feel any obligation one way or the other on it. I feel very neutral about it. Thanks, Dan. Anybody else ex parte? Okay. Um, in that uh, case, can we please begin with a staff report? Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Joe Matier, Senior Planner, the assigned planner for this project. Tonight before you is a public hearing item. It's a discretionary permit. Uh, two items are uh, before the Commission tonight. One is a design review because the project is a new development within the neighborhood conservation area um, and then also a tree removal permit. And the tree removal permit is kind of baked into the project because without the removal of the trees, the structures and the infrastructure would not be possible. So we tied those together. Staff recommends the Planning Commission approve uh, the action that is submitted as part of the attachment A of the uh, staff report for the approval of the design review and the tree removal permit. Um, part of that action first would be to adopt a categorical exemption according to the California uh, Environmental Quality Act, a class three for small structure, new small structures. And then um, the action includes findings of approval and conditions of approval. And it's based on the application material that you'll find as exhibit three of the attachment A. Um, we have a vicinity map. It's uh, uh, the 
engineering department doesn't assign addresses until there's a structure there. So this is a vacant property that was created in the, uh, through a, a subdivision in the 1970s. And it's uh, mid-block on Union Street between 12th and 13th. So the location's right here. This is a, uh, another view of it here. It has a couple of uh, uh, constraints on the site. There is an 11-foot uh, slope easement right along the frontage of Union Street. And then there is a sewer mainline easement. It's a 20-foot easement to the west of that. And then there is a Campbell Creek drainage easement. And these were created as part of a subdivision map. I do show the location of the two of the trees that would require a tree removal permit. Uh, essentially, trees over the uh, diameter of 16 inches require a tree removal permit. There's a couple other trees that are smaller than that that don't necessarily require a tree removal permit, but I did show those as well as the possibility of being removed as part of this action. Here's a close-up of where the development uh, area would be on the site. So uh, this is Union Street to the, to the right. Um, it's about 11,000, just over 11,000 square foot parcel. As I mentioned, there's quite a bit of encumbrances and constraints on the property. Uh, so the development would be uh, located outside the slope easement, but then in the developable area outside the sewer easement and the uh, Campbell Creek drainage easement. It's about a 2,900 square foot structure. Habitable space is about 2,200 square feet. It does include a single family residence with a attached uh, accessory dwelling unit and an attached garage. Um, there is the, um, a little bit of a drop off as it slopes kind of to the west, southwest of the property. To maintain grade, there will be some fill added to the frontage area of that to have uh, nice access off of Union Street. Here's a picture of some of the elevations. It's the east elevation, the top from uh, Union Street as you look at it. So you have the uh, two-car garage here. It almost appears as a single-story residence from this elevation here. Um, and then as you see from the south elevation, it is kind of a tiered two-story with an um, accessory dwelling unit on the lower level and living quarters on the upper portion of it. There are some architectural features that are uh, um, compatible with that Bayview neighborhood area. We have, uh, it does have the metal roof, which is a little more modern um, material use, but then the window designs and the, the knee braces and the brackets and the type of doors and stuff like that. It does make a nice, uh, almost craftsman style uh, development. There'll be wood siding, uh, shake wood siding on the, the structure itself. And then we have uh, the view from the west. That would be if you were at Campbell Creek and looking to the east would be this structure here. And then from the north elevation here. Um, so there is a uh, somewhat of a retaining wall. And then there is a fence and stuff like that on that north elevation. The packet does include uh, an attachment uh, for the findings of approval, exhibit um, one. And we do want the commission to consider adopting the categorical exemption for new construction. It would include the um, removal of those trees as well. Um, and then the does have the findings for design review in the neighborhood uh, conservation area, as well as the tree removal permit compliance. Typically, um, if this was a developed parcel and they were going to remove four trees or less in a 10-year period that are over 16 inches in diameter, this would be reviewed as a ministerial permit. There would be no public hearing on this item. So it is a little unique, um, and that's why we tied the conditions of approval and the findings of approval to the submittal of a building permit. We don't want speculation where the trees are removed and we don't have any investment in that uh, potential development of that site. So that's why that condition of approval is uh, um, managed that way. Um, conditions of approval, uh, we have the sewer line connection. If they use gravity feed from the, the proposed residents, the city engineer would like to have, uh, make sure they take a look at those uh, details of the uh, attachment to that and then have a site inspection. Um, the driveway surface on their application, you'll see that it does have previous pavers. 
Uh, we just want them to be installed to the uh, manufacturer specifications and use material that is designed for that purpose. We've had uh, a project once that used chimney brick that was used for a paving surface, and they're really not designed for that intensity there. And then I mentioned some of the uh, uh, tree removal conditions of approval. One would be that it's uh, not conducted until after a full application for a building permit is submitted. Um, typically, we do on-site bird survey to ensure that there are no impacts from that activity to any nesting or roosting birds. And then also any of the following of that tree that it does not impact that uh, on-site uh, sewer main. Um, other than that, the staff um, has that recommendation in the staff report, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I do know that the uh, applicant property owner is available and their agent, the architect that did the design. Uh, staff received one public comment, and it was a letter of support or an email of support for the project. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that staff report, Joe. Do any commissioners have any questions or comments before I open public comment? Well, Judith, go ahead. Um, yeah, I have two questions. Well, three questions. First, the reason that this is coming before us is first that it's a Bay Bayview um, neighborhood conservation, and second, that you want to make sure that the tree removal permit um, is actually a, se a, a separately considered action, even though otherwise, if the building had already been built, it would have been ministerial. To answer the first question, the reasons before the planning commission is tonight is under the design review policies, uh, table 7-2, uh, for projects located in the neighborhood conservation area, they're broken down to different categories. Uh, for this particular project, because it's new construction of a single family residence in a neighborhood conservation area, it does require discretionary planning commission review. What's interesting about this project is that uh, the accessory dwelling unit is less than 800 square feet. So theoretically, that would not be under the purview of the Planning Commission, but because it came in as one package, that is why we kind of um, uh, brought it to the Commission uh, like this. As far as the tree removal permit, if it was a vacant property and there was no intent to develop the property, then it would become a discretionary tree removal process. So when trees are being removed on vacant property, um, maybe for, I'm not sure why they would do that because there's not really a, maybe a, a clearing for a building site, there's no development there, so there's no real, real property that's gonna be impacted by it. But our code does specify that in those cases, it's a discretionary permit. In this case, they're proposing development. The trees are clearly associated with that uh, development occurring, so we brought it together and packaged it that way. Thank you. That um, there were two other things that were mentioned in the packet that um, you've, I'm not sure you said anything about. The first one was there was a wall encroachment. That um, I'm I'm not sure where that wall is. Yes, the, actually the applicant owns the property to the south, and it is a small retaining wall on the south property line, and I believe it has to do with some of the parking turning radius on the adjacent parcel that the property owner owns. Under, um, there's a civil code section that doesn't require a property owner to have an easement for use of their property. Um, if if somebody else owned the southern parcel, um, I mean, it could eventually create some complications in the future. But right now, that property owner sort of has the right to develop over that property and access that property. If it was a subdivision, um, and we would want to ensure that future property owners would know of that um, to, um, complication there, um, I'm not really sure. It, uh, you know, I just brought it up and just wanted to make clear that there, there was that uh, small uh, discrepancy in that property line on the south here. Um, they could 
may, you know, I'll maybe defer and ask that the um, property owner or their agent uh, address that and see what kind of uh, uh, future fixes they might have in place. There could be a lot line adjustment that would fix that. I don't know. It's, sometimes it's almost like uh, uh, doing a lot of work to correct a small minor issue. Maybe that uh, retaining wall could just be removed. Okay, and, and the last question is um, the, the street facing slope easement on Union Street, it, it looks like the driveway goes right over that, um, but, the, but the bushes to the south are what occupy most of it, and on, on my map, I, I couldn't actually see exactly where that easement ended. Okay, it's an 11 foot easement that's recorded on the parcel map and uh, the plans actually show it as a seven foot slope easement. So there is a little discrepancy there. I reviewed this with the city engineer. The property slopes from um, the highest point is up in this, uh, that would be the northwest corner and then slopes to the southwest corner. The driveway, um, the city engineer prefers it to be in this area here. So it aligns with the alley across the street. So there were some things that the, the designer worked with this project on. So there will be fill placed in this area here so that they can enter off of uh, Union Street and drive into the, the garage. And so you see this here. Um, this is not elevated above the grade at Union Street. Um, so it is a little bit of a, um, um, basically from Union, they're almost going to drive straight into here, um, if that makes sense. This is a better view of it here. Uh, well, not necessarily, but uh, um, <laughs> it is going to drop down slightly, but um, yeah. Um, but that was all reviewed. The, the slope easement benefits the city of Arcata. So if there is any in engineered fill going in here, you know, that would be reviewed um, part of the encroachment permit and the building permit for the development. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, if, unless I'm mistaken, the, the drawing show uh, solar panels on the roof, is that, I thought I saw a photo, of, maybe I'm misinterpreting, photovolt Volcan yes, on the uh, south elevation, there are some panels here. Okay. Yes, sir. I, my, my question is: is, is that is a city is that a city requirement, or is that something the property owners is doing on their own? Um, I believe it's tied to state building code, um, and so that so the building department would implement that through the building permit review. Thank you. Any other uh, questions from commissioners? If not, then um, as we, uh, per usual, I will invite the applicant and or their agent to speak first. Uh, we will then open for public comment and that will be limited to three minutes per speaker. And the applicant will have the opportunity to speak last if they wish. Go ahead, thank you. we've called the middle lot uh, that fronts on Union between 12th and 13th. My primary residence for the past 45 years has been the house next door on the corner of 12th and Union. I love my current house, but as I get older, I find I need a living space with no stairs and a level entry for myself. And so that was really the driving design consideration um, that's reflected in the floor plan and the driveway entrance. Since the slope of the parcel allows for a downstairs unit, we've included one which meets the code requirements for an ADU. Campbell Creek flows out of the community forest and forms the backyard of all three parcels that face Union. We've been particularly mindful of the riparian zone, and we've provided for wide setbacks, including the sewer easement, and we will avoid any disturbance to the creek. I'd like to introduce my outstanding architect for the project, Martha Jane. 
Um, Martha lives in Arcata and has experience in designing many projects in Arcata and Eureka, both residential and commercial, including a residence in this same Bayview neighborhood. So she brings um, an understanding and a feeling for the neighborhood, the massing, this, uh, the structural styles um, uh, in this, for this uh, conservation district. As you can see, Martha has prepared a very comprehensive set of plans with a lot of information in them uh, and images. So I don't have any particular new information to offer you now, but Martha and I are, are here to answer any questions that you have. But before I close, I'd really like to thank and compliment Joe Matier, who's been very helpful and responsive and has written a comprehensive staff report. I also want to thank the rest of the city's staff who were involved in the pre-application process. This is a very helpful part of your, <laughs> of your um, requirements your, for applicants um, in flagging items of particular importance. So I want to thank Public Works and Environmental Services and your reviewers on the fire and the sewer and the drainage and other provisions who commented on this during the, during the development. They've all been very helpful, and so I want to compliment them, too. So with that, thank you for your time and your review, um, and we're here to answer questions. I don't know if I should respond to some of those that Commissioner Mayor raised now or later. Uh, if you'd like to, or if um, the architect would like to speak to those, whichever uh, is Let fine. me just um, quickly respond to this little jog of retaining wall from my house, it's, uh, yes, we built a retaining wall for the parking, for the driveway entrance and a parking spot. And we didn't know exactly where the property line was at the time, but we owned them both and they were just open space. And so for a short distance, it does encroach on the other parcel. If when the time comes that these need to be, um, that situation needs to be fixed, it's easy to remove that retaining wall and just, grade it through. I don't recall any other questions at the moment that um, I don't think so. I can respond to. So thank you very much. Thanks very much for that. Anything to add? If not, that's fine. But if so, now's your chance. I don't see any. So um, uh, that said, uh, if there's any public comment, um, then uh, now's the time to line up. I know we do have at least one speaker online, but if anyone here uh, at City Hall would like to speak to this project. David, um, someone online? Or did, did you want to speak? Please come up to the lectern. Well, we're waiting for that, Bob. If you could raise your hand again. The um, attendees disappeared on my Zoom screen again. Thank you. So I'm Latif Burdick. I live on a uh, corner of 11th and A. So I have a bird's eye view of Andrea's existing house. And uh, I'm really glad to see the plans because I, I think they do a great job of architecturally fitting in the neighborhood. You know, I've been a builder myself for 35 years and I did all the design work for most of my projects, and mostly in Arcata and the county. And uh, I love our neighborhood. I've been there for 40 years myself. And I, I see no problems with this. I, you know, I, I trust the design. I trust the, the owner uh, that they're going to do a, a, a right, right forward job. So. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Bob. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Hi. Um, so when you look at those, those uh, pictures, our house is the one just above it. So we're, we're on the corner of 13th and Union. So we'll, we will be the closest neighbor. Uh, and so we've gone over these plans with, with Andrea. She's been very helpful in, in, in listening to our concerns. Uh, and we are completely in support of, of this project. Um, and we, I'm not sure if this is the actually the right venue, but we thought that it might be a good 
good opportunity to raise the 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 issue of uh, traffic on the street uh, on on Union Street because it's a heavily trafficked street uh, with no um, nothing in place that could help to calm traffic. Uh, so if I'm not sure if that's in your uh, wheelhouse, but it's something that we're very interested in in somehow combining with this project if if that were possible or we just take this idea to to some other group uh, and we would be uh, interested in your suggestions as to who to go to thank you for your yeah. comments okay. yeah and bob i would say um you could reach out to our city engineering team um, and ask for natra katri our our city engineer thank you Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other commenters? Yes. Uh, go ahead, Jane. Hi, Jane Woodward. I'm delighted to see this project happening. I think this is the kind of project we want. It's got solar panels. It's got the new metal roofing to which the panels adhere, and the roofing is long-lasting. Um, it has an accessory dwelling unit, which we're also promoting, which allows for additional uh, units to be available. Um, I think she's done a great job of fitting this in in an area that needs to be preserved on the west side of the property. So I thank you, Andrea Tuttle, for doing this. Thanks for your comments, Jane. That's all. All right, thanks to everyone who commented either here in person or online. Um, are there any additional questions for staff or do commissioners have any thoughts or comments they'd like to share? Oh, I would just like to say that I think it's a fabulous uh, project. Everybody seems to be in agreement um, and fits in very well with the environment and the neighborhood. And if you're ready for a motion, I'd be happy to give one. I am ready for a motion. I'd like to move to approve the design review and tree removal permit for Tuttle Residential Development on vacant property located on Union between 12th and 13th Street, including the conditions of approval. Great. Can we get a second? I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. And just to clarify, that includes the, uh, the CEQA exemption identified in the staff report in the action. As presented, thank you. Great, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Congratulations. I think we're all looking forward to see that, see that project take shape. Take shape. Okay. Uh, next on our agenda, uh, the next item is business item B. Consider a recommendation to the city council on the general plan updates and as usual can we begin with a staff report please yeah good evening commissioners um for you tonight we have the public safety element and the infrastructure element um and as our uh process uh has been developed or as we've developed our process i've got the uh I've got your comments here compiled for uh, public facilities. I would suggest we begin there. Um, hold on a second. Sorry, a few technical uh, technical issues that we're, we're trying to address. We're going to douse the lights a bit. Um, so we've got uh, first on your list the consent calendar considerations. Um, we did compile these, send them out, and publish them online. Put them in the binder uh, as per usual. So. Um, I'll go ahead and leave it there for the chair to take over and facilitate us going through these items. Great. Um, everyone's had a chance to look at this consent list. Is there any items on the consent list that any commissioner would like to pull for discussion? If not, is anyone opposed to approving these consent items in one shot? No comments, no opposition. Let's green light those and move on to the next piece of this. Okay. 
into the policy pitch section. Um, as these items come up, whoever has made the policy pitch, please jump in with a brief elevator pitch regarding uh, the proposed change, and then we will uh, take it from there. I think that was probably mine. Um, and there, there were several of them in that box um, under the guiding principles and goals. Um, the, the first one was, I think for all of these sections, the guiding principles and goals should go right after the introduction um, and before the background material rather than right before the policy list. Um, and I, I think staff may have um, addressed that and that hopefully is what's going to happen. Um, is that something that you could comment on, David? The position of the guiding principles and goals? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I um, tuned out to help Joe orient a little bit. Uh, was the question whether we are proposing to reorient these? I think there was a recommendation for that, and we've had support for that. Um, staff doesn't really have a comment one way or the other whether to have the goals go before the introduction. It's, it's okay. I, I, I guess my suggestion was after an introduction to the element, that's where the guiding principles and goals should go before you get into all the very, very lengthy um, background and current conditions. So um, what I've done with these suggestions is to um, suggest moving those and then adding um, to some of them. Um, so do you, want, do you want me to talk about the several additions here or go one by one? Uh, let's take them piece by piece, I think. Unless you feel like they're going to hang together cohesively and not require separate discussion. Okay. Um, the first one was for A, um, for the um, water supply to add um, a note that we want not just adequate water supply, but safe and affordable water supply and delivery systems. Um, this obviously addresses our uh, leaping, jumping, and hopping um, water rates in, in town, which I'm sure if we haven't all experienced them yet, we're going to get hit pretty soon. Um, and so that seemed like um, important language that we can't um, just assume that infinite water rate increases are going to be sustainable. Um, the second one was in B um, to add a note that... Um, can, I, can I jump in real quick? Yeah. I'm sorry. I, and part of my confusion um, was um, when I was putting this together, uh, you'll note that sometimes there are some staff comments here that I add in bold brackets. Um, I was unclear what the what the change was. I didn't go back and forth between the original uh, okay, uh, I, document, and now I see the change. And I guess uh, you know, a after reading these and understanding that you are this gold color or whatever whatever color it, you want to interpret, it came out be. brownish. Yeah, the brownish um, color. Let's call it yeah. brownish gold. So I think um, all the I think brownish staff can support ones. all of these policy changes. So um, if everyone has read this and you're comfortable moving forward, I would I would move this to the consent, so to speak. That's fine with me, but... Um, Great. Then if staff is uh, not opposed, do any commissioners, uh, anyone have any opposition to adopting this language? Okay. Um, one of the things I would just like to point out, because it's in a slightly different mode than the others, is the addition um, in F with regard to public facilities as gathering places, um, adding a special note on the protection of civil and constitutional rights, specifically um, rights to assemble and um, rights of speech, as well as um, you know freedom of religion, all those Bill of Rights things there. Um, Great. I don't think that changes anything for anyone. So let's adopt those en masse and get to the next item. Um. Yeah, PF2B, I'll just note there's a lengthy staff comment in there. I think this comment is good. Um, I would just remove the uh, requirement that they be publicly review reviewed through the city committees and commission. Um, there are different processes that are set up for different um, uh, uh, pathways and requiring that they go through committees and commissions 
Um, this is not likely to be supported by, by council. Um, certainly, we've seen a shift in that uh, over time. And so I think in general, this idea is, is, um, is a good one. I would just remove that language. Um, that's the language that I um, very explicitly wanted added. And I feel that it's extremely important, especially given some of the controversies around the wastewater treatment system and the fact that um, these are often very complex matters that the public would appreciate understanding and more to the point having a forum to weigh in on other than simply before the city council. So that is very explicitly the language that I propose to add. Uh, does anyone on the commission have an opposing view or any, any comments to add to that given uh, staff's take? Go ahead, Matt. I'm mostly just looking for clarification. So every time there was a new planning assumption made by staff, it would come before a committee or I, I'm just I'm trying I, to understand I, I, I think that um, because some of the issues associated with the wastewater treatment plan aren't just, you know, routine maintenance or even, you know, fairly minor upgrades of, you know, a million or two dollars each, but humongous changes amounting to 50 million plus each, I feel that it's very important for those to be addressed, not just by the city council, but by commi committees or commissions um, where the details of those proposals can be vetted with the public. And that's certainly something that happened with um, our uh, current upgrade of 50 plus million dollars. And I really appreciated that. And I think the public did as well, um, especially as we're looking to address concerns about um, sea level rise that may be coming up in the future. Uh, we're going to have another many million dollars of additional um, work that I would hope we would not adopt lightly or without a great deal of public review. Um, the Planning Commission and our committees offer a forum to do that, and that's how we should use our public forums. Thanks, Judith. David, is it... Am I understanding you correctly that the position of staff is is in the language or the, the corrections, the response that you made is aimed at protecting the authority of the city council to be the ultimate decider of whether it goes to cities or uh, committees or the planning commission? Am I getting that right? That, yeah, that's a good summary. Another way of uh, changing this to be uh, more palatable would be instead of re saying shall be reviewed, uh, should be reviewed, and then at the end at the discretion of the, of the council. Um, the way it's currently written, it's it's overly broad and captures uh, you know myriad different processes that currently don't have that level of review that probably don't warrant that level of review. I think pointing to a wastewater treatment plan upgrade that costs fifty million dollars is uh, you know uh, you know kind of project that certainly you want to have a lot of eyes on and, and discussion about. Uh, but this captures all kinds of changes in planning assumptions, best available science, priorities, goals that simply are just not going to go through a planning commission review process. I would interpret this broadly <coughs> enough that the uh, city council could not set its goals for uh, you know, spending for the year for the budget without first going through committee and commission review. And I just simply don't think they're going to accept that. If you do want to approve this the way that it's written currently, you know, I would encourage you to go ahead and take that action. Um, but I will note that, you know, similar to the, um, uh, to the, the, gateway element where we've had policies that enhance or you know refine or, or better uh, uh, interpret the intent uh, that supports city's actions you know those will be placed in line uh, this kind of language will be placed um, in a recommendation that goes on the side not in line in the document uh, to identify to the council the reason why the staff uh, does not believe this is uh, in their best interest to adopt Got it. Could you possibly um, type the language suggestion that you uh, suggested would make this uh, easier for staff to support and then we can all look at it and see if we can get to agreement? Commissioner Mayor, how did you feel about the staff recommendation? 
I'm I'm looking at it. I'd like to send shall to the council and ask them to chop it if that's what they want. Does anyone on the Planning Commission have a, a problem with language as just suggested? Which language as uh, suggested? The, the, the shall and then leave it under discretion of the City Council to make that final decision. I have that, a problem with that. I, I would like to see shall remain and... That, that's what I, I'm sorry, that's what I was suggesting. That and obviously the city council has discretion over virtually everything we do. Um, is there a dollar figure also being suggested here? I mean... I, mean, I think that you're basically legislating through policy by adopting this, um, this language. And policies are intended to establish the framework for adopting legislation. Um, so I, I think that on, on those grounds alone, I would you know, recommend against that. But I think this softens it enough to, to where it still retains the uh, city council's authority to direct when, where, and how, under what circumstances, under what budget levels. We're not establishing that in advance. Um, we don't know what the conditions are gonna be. I trust the uh, representatives to, to make um, you know, good decisions related to those, so. Um, one, one thing that would make it reasonable for me to see that change if you added to the language I suggested um, major goals priorities something like that yeah. obviously this the City Council has d discretion regardless but I think that um, we could trust staff to determine what a major goal planning assumption or other change um, would come before the planning commission i'd like us to kind of lock in on something here or maybe if we're going to need a lot more discussion about this maybe move off of this item is this, if we add major goals that i think maybe gives the city council a little more latitude to define what's major or not um how does the commission feel about um how does the commission feel let's take a straw poll right about the language as it is right now with shall being in instead of should and the add-on at the end regarding discretion of the city council is everyone is there anyone that's opposed to this language being adopted okay let's adopt it as is and move on to the next item when you say adopt it as is which language are you referring to uh, Sh the the language as it says up on the screen now shall instead of should okay and the addition of at the discretion of the city council being added to the end of the original statement all right could could we see that um ri written as I, I think it is well no it, it it hasn't been written we've still got two separate statements there just by adding at the discretion of city council but using the but using shall I'm sorry to be so sticky about this but we've had several instances where it wasn't really clear what we were agreeing on and and this time I'd like to make make it quite clear I understand. I feel like everyone here understands what you're getting at. I feel like this language gets us there and... Okay, that, that has it now. Okay. Good. Thank you. Great. Can we get to the next item on our policy pitch list? Yeah, this is my item. And uh, when I read this, uh, it just seemed to me that uh, preserving... I mean, it reads... in. Uh, that uh, we would preserve established community student ratios. And in light of the fact that Cal Poly is expecting to double their student population by the end of this decade, I don't, I don't think we can uh, preserve established community student ratios. I think, the, the, you know, 
there will be more students and not that many more community members. So um, it, it's just, do, do we want to say this or do we just want to eliminate it? I, I, I think I, I get your, your basic point. There's no way we can guarantee that however things flex, that the existing ratios stay the same. Um, delete it and then what would it look like how would it read well it, it, it so would just end at the just yeah, everything before the bold yeah i think type. we if if the commission chooses to delete, delete this then we can um we can make sure that the language as modified you know makes sense but okay. i think i get i fully understand where commissioner lehman's coming from um, that's a reasonable point is anyone opposed to deleting that language Okay, so deleted. Okay, and I, I have to uh, admit when I was going through these, I guess I thought the underline was the original language. I wasn't sure what was changing here. Um, so again, let me um, read through this uh, quickly as you all are. Um. I think that was probably mine. Yes, it was. And I think that this language is fine or something, you know, something similar to this. Um, I, I understand the, the intent of where you're going here. So staff doesn't have any concerns with this. I originally, the only reason I moved this into the policy pitch and not into the um, consent items is because I wasn't sure where the changes were being made. Um, Got it. Does anyone have any concerns with this item or need to discuss it further? Um. I would like to change. Um, it should be receiving waters of the state, not California. So it just to be waters of the state and waters of the U.S. So it's in receiving waters. Yeah. So it should be receiving waters of the state. Um, I, I guess the reason I I said the waters of the U.S. I can't even read how little it's written yeah, that's, here. That's appropriate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is is that the Clean Water Act does address waters of the yeah, United States, and so um, it that also mm -hmm. gets at some of the um, other ways in which we use waters of the United States. And yeah, it's the federal and the state and nexus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it also it also allows us to address. Um, some wetlands issues and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was going to say that, and then um, it should be compliance with the state water um, quality control board, not regional California regional water quality control board. It's the state water board. Um, uh, Seem like good catches. And again. Uh, NPDS permit it's I think it's a state board state water quality control board standards in regard to the NPDS and I don't know if you want if we want to do permit permit I think we can just eliminate the added what do you what, what was the purpose yeah, we, behind we, permit after permit yeah, again we don't have to finesse the language in this form when yeah. we go through and clean this up we'll, we'll revise all yeah, that cool as, as long as we're <laughs> I think locked it, in on policy level stuff we don't have to worry yeah. so much about yeah uh, yep. yeah so we'll, we'll make pieces. these we'll make these updates um cool. well I don't, I don't know i don't know if you guys yeah those well those are good if ads. everyone wants to yeah <laughs> does cool. does anyone have any qualms with adopting as proposed thanks for yep. those additions well, christian good to go yeah Okay, let's uh, green light that and move forward. I think that was mine also. Um, and that refers to the history of the design of the marsh um, as, a, as a, a treatment facility and wildlife refuge. Um, the city historically um, paid money to the university um, for various types of research and engineering projects. Um, given the burden that the university will be increasing on our wastewater treatment facilities um, over the coming years, I think that um, the idea that the city would pay the university to figure out how to um, address 
the additional wastewater burden that the university will be providing to the city is inappropriate. And so I suggested that um, the city should collaborate with Cal Poly um, to seek funds for future research. Um, I, th I think that old language was a relic of the year 2000, and now we're in 2023 looking forward to 2045. Yeah, I, would, I, I think this is a, a, a good revision. Um, I would suggest that we soften this as well. The city shall renew the program, um, you know, especially if we're taking out as long as the funds are available, um, that we soften this to the city should, you know, continue the program where so, appropriate or okay, something like that. Okay, yeah, should, should is better. Okay, with the change to should and a green light from staff, do any commissioners have uh, any qualms with adopting this language? None the scene, so adopted. Okay. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, let me just make a comment. Um, the, the university's research um, coordinator has been Bob Gearhart all this time and he's getting older and um, I don't know how much longer he's going to do it and he does it out of the goodness of his heart so I would encourage the city to um, to work with the university to renew the research effort because it'll It'll be necessary, and Bob's not going to be around for a long period of time to do it. Yeah, that that's really important, and it's important important to recognize the contributions um, that he and his colleagues and students have made over the years. Um, Thanks for that, Peter. Uh, the next item is. Item six, PF2B, whose who's proposal was this? That's me. Okay, Peter, fire so, away. Uh, you know, I, I read the staff comment. Um, my understanding from the, uh, the session we had with uh, uh, the local engineers and um, the, state en uh, the state personnel was that despite the fact that a one meter rise by 2050 is unlikely, um, that the state was urging us as planners to plan for it, even though it's pretty unlikely. I, as I remember, it was a half a percent chance, one in 200 chance. Um, so that's why I put this in there is because that was my understanding from that workshop we had. Now, I don't know, do you think that's different, David? Um, I guess that this doesn't exactly uh, uh, dovetail with the work that we've done thus far on the local coastal program. Um, and it hems us into a specific elevation when um, I think that m our jurisdiction and most other jurisdictions uh, throughout the world actually are moving more towards a um, what's called adaptation pathways has sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, without getting into too much detail here, has a little bit more nuanced approach than just saying, look, we're going to fix this at one meter. And that's what we're going to plan for. Um, I would be cautious about adopting something that could be seen as in conflict with the other body of policy that we've done in the local coastal program. And I would encourage us to maybe defray this conversation until we start looking at that local coastal program where we talk in a lot more depth about what our adaptation policies are. That's a, it's okay with me to do that. Um, I do think that, um, you know, this is a new world for me, and I, I don't know what level of risk we as a planning commission should assume. And 
this is a pretty cautious approach, a one in 200 chance, but um, I, I just, I'm not sure what the right thing to do is. I, I think you're right. I don't think any of us know what the right answer is or what the right balance of the housing crisis on the one hand is and the concerns about sea level rise are on the other. I, I think we could probably do something to incorporate language that would maybe drive the adaptation pathways to acknowledge the likelihood of a one meter sea rise or something like that. But I also think when we are discussing the local coastal program, we'll be in the context of more uh, more details around specifically this. If you're okay with it, we can um, bike rack this and bring it back more actively when we get to the LCP. Is that okay? Is that jive with staff? Yeah, you could bike rack it. The idea behind bike racking items is that you're going to get back to them through this process. The local coast program is on a different track, but if you want to bike rack it to the LCP, that would be something different. I just want to be clear about that. Yeah, I just mean, um, and maybe bike rack's not the right place or term, but I want to I want to keep this as something that we're going to discuss, but with the specific intention of discussing it in the context of the local coastal program and we get to it. Did, did anyone else here... Um, hear what I heard at that workshop? I this, mean, am, tell me if I'm nuts. I heard a different number for critical infrastructure. I heard a, a, a larger or a, a higher elevation than one meter, so and what we should be considering. So, but I'm gonna leave it to the director and, and to planning staff to, to massage that within our plan. Is anybody, uh, Judith, go ahead. Yeah, um, when when we were discussing the local coastal program before it, we put it aside in order to start on this stuff, one one of the big issues was: Are we going to talk about um, benchmarks that would trigger particular types of action, and then are we going to attach dates to those benchmarks? Um, and we never resolved that. We heard what staff was recommending. Um, but if we can make sure that this um, very specific thing comes into our discussion of the local coastal program, um, that, that would really help because staff's recommendation was basically that, that we put particular signals into the program to take particular types of action but not attach dates to them. And um, we never resolve that. So that's something we're going to have to do. And exactly this kind of language is what we would need to debate on that. So I think I'm hearing everybody's comfortable um, turning this gray and picking it up when we get to the. Yeah, sea just level in some way bookmark it to the LCP discussion. And then let's move on to the next item. Does that mean we go back to the language that the draft included in PF2B or that we eliminate PF2B altogether? I'm suggesting that we um, pause this discussion and have it in the context of the LCP when that comes before us. Oh, the question, I guess the, the elephant in the room is when are we expecting to see and when are we expecting to discuss the LCP? Um, the LCP should be, you know, coming up sometime later this year. We'll be taking a, another look at it. Uh, the commission has already reviewed a lot of the policy work. Uh, we're working on a uh, coastal grant right now, coastal commission grant, to do the uh, balance of the um, uh, the zoning for it. And so I think you'll start seeing that uh, later this year, early next year, uh, with an anticipated adoption date in 2025 at this point. Well, that sounds a little problematic. <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, um, 20, 20, I would offer that 2050 is much farther out than 2025. Totally. So we have time but in, to respects, in respects to, to graying it and discussing it with the LCP, that, you know what I mean, in regards of what we just consented on. Okay, well, on. I'm going to so. suggest we bike rack it one way or the other because the, yeah, the, the point is the, to try and get I, through the policies tonight. Yep. We are not going to get through this tonight. It's a very right. data-rich uh, discussion. Yep. So, 
yeah, let's let's bike rack it. And if we if we end up um, uh, getting through the bike rack before the LCP comes back, then we can take another crack at it. Um, but uh, I don't think we're going to get through it tonight. So I'd like to keep the discussion moving forward. So this is the existing two F uh, two uh, PF two B rather. So, you know, to my read, this is sufficient in this setting to be able to refer us back to those adaptation planning works that we're doing elsewhere. The wastewater treatment plan is going to have a whole body of work around it. Um, the uh, local coastal program already has a whole body of work around it and will continue to. And then we've got uh, upcoming adaptation planning work that environmental services is taking the lead on. So there's a lot of that coming in the, in the near future. And the LCP is a coordinated effort with other governmental agencies around the Bay, correct? So uh, correct. It's yeah. not just Arcata that's working. The LCP, LCP is just specifically Arcata, but we are working collaboratively regionally. Okay. Uh, next item then. Let's see. I'm going to change the color on this. I, I made this a different color so that we could identify that this was not in, whoops, this was not in your packet. Uh, this was language that uh, came uh, in, I believe, Commissioner Mayer's uh, recommendations, and I was waiting to get some input from others on it, and I inadvertently uh, left it out of this, this packet here. So you have not seen this yet. Um, Commissioner Mayer, do you want to uh, take a crack at this, and then I can weigh in on some of the, the uh, information that I've received from uh, consulting with staff? Uh, sh sure. Yeah, um, there was a, there was a water conservation policy um, in the draft um, that was weak, and I think we can make it stronger, especially in light of our expectations that uh, water shortages are not going to leave the state of California, and that we can actually adopt policies in our general plan that will give our city some teeth um, to enforce water conservation requirements. That's what that language would do. So um, the concerns I had were um, related to, uh, you know, sort of the financial implications of implementing such, uh, you know, policies. I coordinated with our uh, city attorney, our finance director, city manager, and um, Rachel Hernandez, our wastewater operations and compliance manager. And um, the the finance director was concerned having, uh, you know, these sorts of um, regressive uh, uh, fees in place without having uh, taken some necessary steps to establish the um, you know, the, the, uh, the problem in advance, the environmental problem in advance. And then uh, Rachel provided some uh, important input that in Chapter 8 of the city's 2020 Urban Water Management Plan, uh, water shortage contingency planning is addressed. Right now, we actually don't have water shortages like the rest of the state. In fact, we kind of have the exact opposite problem where, you know, our water rights are at risk because of the lack of use of water. Um, and so it's not quite, you know, at that critical point, but we are planning for it. Um, and she cited some, some language here um, uh, that is something that you could consider if you felt like uh, adopting something like this, but um, that's, that's sort of the feedback. So sort of a lukewarm recommendation for not adopting this, but we have a, a alternative policy for you if you'd like to hear that. Could we hear that? Sure. Uh, it says, in response to water shortages, the city will work collaboratively, cooperatively with the regional water supplier and the supplier's other municipal customers to implement an effective water shortage contingency plan that defines response actions based on the severity of the water shortage. The city will implement specific end-use restrictions and prohibitions based on the severity of the water shortage to achieve the target water usage reduction identified in the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan. In-use prohibitions shall be determined based on current conditions, recommendations of a regional water task force, and historic water use data and trends, and will be 
considered for mandatory penalties, charges, and other escalating enforcement actions, including education and outreach, issuing verbal written warning, penalty assessment, and water service termination. So this language also has not been fully vetted, but something to that effect, kind of putting it out instead of saying that um, uh, that we should consider imposing these in response to these extreme water shortages, identifying that you know we don't have extreme water shortages now, that we've got plans in place for these contingencies. If those contingencies occur, if they trigger, then we will follow up with these types of policy actions based on recommendations of future decision makers. I, I don't see those two statements as being contradictory at all. Um, they, they are... Um, simply putting a shorter version of that longer version as a policy into our plan. Um, we could also simply refer to uh, the language that you just read, in which case members of the public will have no idea what we're talking about because they will not have read that language. Um, and this makes clear that um, the city may consider something which you already gave us a list of. And so I, I don't see any harm in including that in the plan. I, I think your language is fine. What I would offer is to add the first sentence, in response to water shortages, the city will work co cooperatively with the regional water supplier and the supplier's municipal customers to implement an effective water shortage contingency plan that defines response actions based on the severity of the water shortage and then the, I think, second to last or maybe last sentence that starts with in-use prohibition shall be determined based on current conditions, recommendations, of regional water task force, and historic water use data trends, et cetera. So if you're comfortable adding those couple of sentences around, like uh, maybe the, the bread to your, um, you know, cheese and, and avocado there. That sounds great. Okay. Anybody opposed to that? Okay. Um, does anyone mind if we crack some windows for oxygen up here on the dais? There, there was a second part of that about the building and site development permits. Um, did you want to do anything with that? Um, I think these are already um, regulated through, um, help me with the acronym, Joe. They, they may be regulated through a whole number of things, but getting it in there as a general plan policy, I think is an important step. Yeah, I mean, we have building code um, and all kinds of other uh, requirements for that. So, building code. right, presumably those things yeah, those, would be consistent, yeah, and are, and the general plan is then the yeah, high level document that warns us to watch out for them. Yeah, I don't see a problem with that language. Everyone, good with that? Okay, great. Ever onward. Okay, so um, I guess the question here is if you want to go into these other matters categories. Now, um, just sort of refreshing your memory, these are policies that had questions but not specific recommendations, or if you want to jump into the public facilities, which actually have policy recommendations. Um, My strong preference is that we continue taking up discussions that have specific policy suggestions to them so as not to get sidetracked with something that doesn't even have a clear objective. Is everyone okay with moving on to uh, f the rest of the um, policy suggestions that we have on our agenda this evening? Everyone good with that? Objections? I I'd like to at least uh, take a look at those policy suggestions because in some places they were suggested without specific language just because the um, you know the, the legalese of them might not have been clear and well I mean we've we've looked at them before and we've we've because these are coming back to us from at least one prior meeting uh, this this one is new um, but these are the documents that you receive I'm sorry you did receive these on the 22nd that's right. correct 
Right, so we, we haven't really looked at them, I don't think. And it, one, one of the things about our public facilities um, element right now is that it says nothing about any of our healthcare facilities. Um, although most of them are, lo well, some of them are located on public facilities zoning and so do we want to have a plan where all of our healthcare facilities are addressed in a different element and not even mentioned in our public facilities plan element? I, if I recall correctly, where we landed on this subject at our last meeting was that anyone who'd, who just kind of raised issues without specific policy suggestions could always revisit them and include a policy suggestion which would sort of bump it higher up on our list of things to consider. Again, I'm, I'm concerned that if we get into a discussion about something that doesn't have a specific policy proposal attached to it, it. There was a specific policy proposal. There just wasn't explicit language. There was a decision to make. Do we want to identify our healthcare facilities in our public facilities element? That's the question. Okay, well, let's take a vote of the commission. Do we want to dig into these? Do we want to move forward into our list of items to discuss that have specifically policy suggestions, or do we want to dig into some of these things and see if we can generate some language? At what point would we get back to these other matters? If we're considering them loose ends, are they bike rack or these are bike rack items okay. and if we get through the policy stuff this evening we we would jump right back to these before we move on is that the idea um i yeah, i think that if there's time i think that's the, the if there's framework. time that's the idea it's just okay. difficult to say right now yeah. what we've got about an hour and a half left about an hour and 20 minutes because we need 10 minutes at the end uh um so I'm looking for a preference whether yeah. we move well, forward. Well, my preference would then be to tackle the policy stuff first just because it does seem more straightforward and if we have time to jump back to this other stuff. Okay, Christian? I second Dan's. I agree. Move forward. Joel? I concur. Okay, so let's, let's move forward to the items that have the specific policy pieces, skip ahead, bike rack these, and get back to them as soon as we can. Okay, and I've, I've got more language to reveal that wasn't in your packet, but was added after the fact here. I um, uh, had a com uh, conversation with uh, Commissioner uh, Simmons uh, and added this in, so I'll let, um, uh, let you take this. I'm not sure, this wasn't supposed to end up in the consent calendar. I'm not sure how this ended up there. I made a mistake, I apologize. Yeah, so I had originally proposed uh, two separate policies related to policing. Um, these were both, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just wondering if, I'm sorry, I'm just wondering if uh, this was mistakenly in the consent, if I can move this down to the policy pitch and then you take up the consent policies first. That sounds like a good plan. We're gonna I'm fine with that. I think I had. Um, so you want to roll us back up through the consent? Yep, I'm going to pull this one down as well. These are kind of combined. Okay. So two two items in the consent. I, do we usually give a pitch for consent items or do we just usually go into them? I think they're both mine. I think I'm just looking for people to look at them and see if there's and if there's if there's no objections, we can just adopt these and get on to the next items. Um, but if anyone has wants to pull one for discussion, we can do that as well. Uh, I'm 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 looking for uh, opinions on whether we can pass this consent if anyone's opposed to any of the language in these two consent items. 
Uh, and then just a note from the staff at the bottom here that um, this last policy about smaller fire trucks almost seems like an implementation measure. Does it matter to the commission whether it's put in as impl implementation or policy? Okay. Anyone opposed? That sounds like it makes sense. Okay. So now let's move into, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, so, okay, so I had originally proposed two separate policies that are now being advised by staff to be combined into one policy. Uh, the, the purpose of my original two was one, I had received public comments, sorry, uh, I, I had received public comments urging for both of these two policies. Uh, one was sort of a higher level, you know, we should be working on anti-racism in our police force. And then the second one was very specific incidents where, you know, a lot of uh, police related fatalities happen during traffic stops. Um, had a conversation with staff today uh, where they suggested some new language. Um, I don't know. I don't know how the rest of the commission feels about my language versus the new language, um, but I, I would be okay with the, the staff language. So the new language, uh, in part this, again, generated from some internal vetting with the uh, police chief, the city manager and city attorney. Um, and uh, together we came up with this language here that sort of incorporates both concepts of anti-racism and um, uh, you know, reduction in, in the, the um, de-escalation and reduction in, in police uh, uh, involved shootings. Yeah, absolutely. It says um, the new policy PS7F would be entitled Principled Policing, and it would read, the Arcata Police Department shall conform to state and federal law, California Peace Officer Standards and Training Standards, department policies, and 21st century policing best practices to combat racial profiling and bias in policing and to promote de-escalation and principled policing. And Brian was in support of this. Yes. Go ahead, Judith. Um, I that that's good legal sounding language, and I would suggest taking Matt's language and ending that policy with Matt's language instead of having it at the beginning. There would still be a statement with regard to systemic. Um, and overt racism. I, I feel that um, it's very much in the spirit of um, the legal sounding proposal from staff, um, but provides language that uh, the person on the street will understand. So do I uh, understand you're suggesting to incorporate this language I've highlighted here, anti-racism? Yeah, at, at the end, after your suggestion. Uh, I'd be happy to have my original language back in, and it can be run by the same people as run by today. Does anybody on the commission have uh, any concerns about these proposed language? This proposed language? Uh, yeah, you're going to eliminate felt like it was missing from this section, I'm sure. Yeah, that's not supposed to be that language. That's supposed to be my comment on the language, yeah. There's nothing in this new language talking about um, the difficulty of armed police interacting with citizens. Do we want to say anything explicitly about that? Uh, I just wonder if that creates a whole new department or who, who those people are that aren't police or, I mean, that must be a staffing issue, right? And training and funding. Um, we do have, you know, some novel um, uh, programs that the city has, uh, you know, initiated, uh, including the, the MIST program, uh, the, um, you know, the recent community ambassador program um, there are some of those efforts that, you know, we have, you know, at least piloted. Um, you know, again, I'll, I'll, you know, say just because I know that this was, you know, vetted internally and there were, you know, specific reasons for 
proposing this alternative language, um, you know, we'll pull this down, copy the anti-racism sentiment into that policy, uh, but the, the staff is going to recommend the, the city council take a, you know, take that into consideration before they, they um, adopt this and it, you won't see it reflected, that language reflected in the inline changes because the um, staff have suggested uh, that that's not appropriate for this, for this policy language. So I'll, what I'm hearing is that you want to copy that language that I have highlighted, paste it here, and have PS7F read like this. And I, I will note that the police trainings are a part of the department's policies. Um, you know, already it's part of their, um, you know, the city council's goals, the city council uh, you know, established a series of policies after George Floyd's murder um, that were intended to adopt some of the police reforms that were being promoted uh, by community members across the nation at the time uh, into our department's policies. So, um, you know, a lot of this work has been done. Uh, there are just some concerns about having it specifically uh, in the, the general plan. So if we forward it, uh, the city council will scrutinize it and it may get nixed. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Well, do you want to straw poll on that or how do you want to anyone, go? Anyone opposed to this language? Okay, let's adopt that. And next item. Um, I, I think that this policy, we don't have to go into this too much. I would say take a, a quick poll on it. I think this policy language is um, redundant uh, and unnecessary. That's the only reason why I put it down here. Go ahead, Judith. Um, it, it is redundant, um, but I think one thing that would be helpful there would be to indicate where the public can get access to those um, MSDSs because right now most people don't have a clue who to ask for them. So it might be an implementation measure rather than a policy, but just something to let people know who to go ask. Um, yeah, again, I, I, you know, as one who's lived with MSDSs for a long time, um, I was surprised they weren't mentioned. So uh, I'll just say that. Um, I realize they're required by law, but lots of things in these policies are required by law. Anybody else have comments or concerns about this language? Is there a simple way to just suggest where the public can get this that you have in mind, Commissioner Mayor? I mean, the general plan isn't supposed to be a informational pamphlet about these kinds of things. I think that people can call the city and ask. Um, and uh, MSDS forms are, they're all throughout the city. Wherever we store um, materials, we're required to, to retain them. And so putting a comprehensive list in the general plan would be um, probably inappropriate. Um, noting that you can, you know, reach out to city, the city, I guess, to, to find out where these are would be uh, the most I would recommend that you do, at least at the policy level. Yeah, I, I'm not recommending that there be the MSDS is in the plan. I'm no, just... I recognize that, but there's a proposal on the table to identify how people can find out where our MSDS forms are, yeah. and that's going to be held by a number of different people. There's no MSDS overseer, department director of MSDS, um, so there's going to be many different uh, you know, personnel that they would reach out to to find those specific informations. Go ahead, Judith. Yeah, remembering that this is a plan that we're going to be looking at until 2045 um, as state and federal regulations with regard to um, informing the public about uh, things like chemical hazards are ramped up, which they will be. Um, I, I, would, I, I would actually make it a more general policy than the language um, that you suggested um, to say something like 
uh, the city of Arcata um, promotes public education with regard to um, use, storage, and release of hazardous materials, um, and then refer to some body within the city that the public can go to for um, information and listings. Right now, um, I you know I'm 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 fairly up to speed on a lot of this stuff, and I couldn't tell you who to go ask about what's where. And I think it would be really important for the city to actually act as sort of a clearinghouse for that information, um, even though it is possible to go on s you know state and federal databases and get it directly. That's a really important role that the city can play, and I think it should, and that should be in the general plan. I, I'm, I get your I get your point and I share your concern. I'm not sure how the addition of promotes public education is meaningfully different from the city shall work to develop educational materials explaining hazardous materials impact. Um, uh, but I'm 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 sort of a I'm I'm a f gradients of agreement three on this. Um, but I'm looking for some more feedback from other commissioners. Can I suggest just adding and promote after the word develop, right? Substances to develop and promote educational materials, right? And then it's it's capturing that. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to think of a. Yeah, yeah that, that's helpful, I think. Is okay, we got about three uh, alternatives on the table. <laughs> How do you want to resolve them? I was just imagining, you know, the ability of a citizen who's concerned about something, chlorine at the wastewater treatment plant could come in and read about it somewhere in the city. That's all. Um, well, and they I, can. I, I really, I, I realize it's required, and I don't want to make a big deal of it. I mean, whether it's in here or not, I don't think it's important, but I think it's important for people in the city to know that the information is somewhere and they can come look at it. I have a question. Does the city have a um, illness injury pr uh, prevention program? Yeah. That's where all that stuff lives. It should, and it's that's where the safety data sheets should live. It's, it's no longer MSDSs. So it should, the, all that stuff should be captured in that document so just stating that if we have one which we should so that lays out all all these issues in well, that in IPP is, can we just make reference to that document as um, a way for we're trying to find a way so that the average citizen that wants information here knows where to get it. Is that, does staff feel like that's a reasonable suggestion? Sure. Or yeah. objected? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, I mean, I, I will be honest with you, we've probably spent more time discussing this than we've spent in the last 10 years disseminating this information to anyone who was interested in it. So I would suggest that <laughs> <laughs> you could adopt all of this in some way, shape, or form. If you say, look, we've got this mass of information. I think I get a sense for where you want to go. If you want to adopt all of this, then, then I'll come back with some, some language in the final that sort of tries to reflect everything that you've discussed here and or I'll consult with other you know, staff that you know, know more about the MSDS and the, and the way that we handle them. Uh, to craft some language that tries to get at what you're getting at here, but we're kind of yeah. diverging I, at this point. Yeah. Let's do it. And so, okay. That sounds good. Is everyone in favor of that solution? Okay, and this may be a, a combination of implementation measures and or policy fixes. Great. Okay, sounds everyone's great. Comfortable with that. Let's hit the next item. Okay. Um, again, I'd recommend just dropping here, this. Here we go again. Yeah. So. Attached to LCP discussion. I think two people came up with this concept. 
Great minds think alike. I'll just green this and say see above. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Good job you got through all of the items there. Um, it's about 7.20. Do you want to go back and start working through the public facilities, other matters? Do you want to stick with the public safety, other matters? There's 17 of those in public facilities. Um, can we go through the public safety ones as long as we're on public safety? Because it looks like we'll still have time to get back to the public facilities. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Oh, yeah. There's only one. <laughs> okay. This one's mine again. Um, this PS... 4C talks about requirements for building within flood zone A. Um, and my question is, why are we building in a flood zone? I, and if you look at the map, the flood zone is not a large area. of It's right along the creek. Um, can we, I, let me ask you, can we build in a flood zone? In Arcana? Yeah, there are um, there are uh, building designs that allow you to be able to build in flood zone A. And there's actually quite an extensive area in the south of Samoa, g &H Street, that are in flood zone A as well. Um, so that there are there are allowances for that. You can't build in a flood way, but you can build in a flood zone. Joe has something to add? These are um, regulated by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And uh, so they have kind of, we've actually changed it. It used to be in the land use code part of the zoning. And we added it, moved it over to the municipal code. So we do have programs. We, um, the city engineers, the floodplain administrator, so they manage those policies of the FEMA. And so there are, as David mentioned, there are a lot of language in the municipal code already about those prescriptive measures on how to build uh, within the flood zone. And as an example, through the um, Maple Lane, Baldwin, Cropley, Davis, there is quite a bit of an area that has existing homes that are, they, a lot of them pay, pay flood insurance. There's also places that were built and then later on when they were developed they didn't have a flood map on it and later on FEMA came and um, mapped it as being in the flood zone um, so there are opportunities where you know property owners might want to do an addition or do a second story to it to add a, an accessory dwelling unit um, that they can work with the city engineer and the flood plan you know the FEMA guidelines to let that development occur Go ahead, Judith. Yeah, um, one of the things that we didn't really resolve around that issue is something that's going to come up again in the local coastal program with regard to um, new building in the coastal zone, including South G and H Street, um, which are all in the flood zone. And I, I think if if we can um, address this really explicitly when we come back to the local coastal program as well, that's going to be really important um, because I, I don't think that we came to an agreement on a lot of the particulars of um, flood zone construction. And it seems to me there's a difference between adding a unit to an already existing home or building and building a whole new building in a flood zone. Um, and I mean, buildings that are already in the flood zone, they're in the flood zone. But um, why are we building more? I mean, floods are going to get worse, not better. Uh, 
Anybody else have anything to add to the flood zone A building discussion? I, I think I think we shouldn't assume that there won't be any building in flood zone A, and so it's important to have standards for what would be allowed. E even something as as simple as you know, your 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 garage falls down. Do you get to replace it? If you replace it, what do you have to do with the new design? So we we can't simply not have any policy in there assuming that there will be no construction because there will be some construction and this gives us a way of addressing it. And presumably we already have set guidelines attached to buildings whether they're ADUs or otherwise that get proposed to be built in zone A, correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the standards that uh, Joe was talking about in our municipal code um, and there are sp specific building regulations like you know flow through foundations for example um, that you have to uh, develop if you're in a flood zone um, there's also situations where and I mean I guess we could finesse the policy to to address this but there are situations where um, there's a flood zone that enters the property but the building site is not in the flood zone um, yeah I, I think our, our staff recommendation would be to, to retain this language well, is this something that we would um, be reviewing as part of the LCP discussion? Um, we we certainly could bring it back around and wrap it into that conversation. This policy is not in the um, in the LCP. But this flood zone A, uh, it doesn't all stay within the local coastal. Right. Zone. It does not. It is. Are those standards also in the land use code? Because we are, we are going to come back and, and review modifications to the land use code later. And so it seems like anything that's in the land use code is something that we can reference in the general plan. The flood hazard section is in the municipal code. It's not specifically in the land use code. It was taken out of the zoning ordinance because of the difficulty of going through changes as the feds change the regulations we can easily adapt every time you get a map or something like that a new map and stuff so it is in the municipal code we have very thorough um, flood hazard standards in the city's municipal code right now but but if it's in the municipal code and it's been taken out of the zoning code that basically means it's been taken out of the purview of the Planning Commission is that correct yeah. Okay, so I want to keep it in the purview of the Planning Commission and give us a policy that would let us do stuff like uh, prevent people from building a new ADU in a flood zone. Um, the, the policy choice has already been made to remove it from the land use code. We can certainly pass on if the Commission wants to make a recommendation to move it back in to the land use code, um, we can do that. Um, but at this point, where we stand today, the uh, flood zone ordinance is in the municipal code. Um, the planning commission does have the ability to, you know, uh, make a recommendation to modify this language, which I believe Commissioner Lehman was suggesting we consider in some way, shape or form, consider prohibiting, uh, you know, development in the flood zone um, I think before making that decision, you'd probably want to see what kinds of properties were affected by that change, um, and it would be a you know fairly fairly dramatic shift in policy direction um, that we've had heretofore. Could could we get some idea of which properties would be affected and how many there are? Yes, if the um, you know commission wants to you know, come back to this uh, in the, the bike rack. We'll prepare that if the, uh, you know, commission wants to see that. If you're comfortable with the way the language is now and the way that the program currently works, uh, then we would vote to turn uh, this policy red and not come back to it. So either way. How, how often do these subjects come up? Applicants that 
are in this flood zone A? It's not very frequent. Um, yeah, it's pretty infrequent. And then typically if somebody um, does apply for a building permit in zone A, they're required to mediate the project to accommodate the flood hazard. Yeah, exactly. The, um, the language that you see here, PS4C, is sort of the backbone for allowing us to use the FEMA standards to allow for development in flood zone A, but um, to make sure that those developments don't restrict flood flows or cause uh, human health and safety hazards from um, you know, structures that are you know, pulled off their foundations because they're not designed appropriately and that sort of thing. So Go ahead, Jeff. Th that last sentence there, any development in the floodplain must be consistent with city floodplain zoning regulations. Is that also re referring to um, the combining zone and the setbacks and stuff like that, which are in the zoning code? Um, I think your Hawkeye just caught a um, boo-boo from our editorial, um, you know, refinement of this document. Can, I think that, that we, should not say we, zoning regulation. It just should say floodplain regulations. Can, can we can we ask um, staff to de-boo-boo it somehow and we can, then we bring can de -boo -boo that, that back yeah. to us? There's a fancy word for that. We'll, we'll fix that. Yeah. Okay, so are we okay with that change and then? I'm okay with it and moving on. And moving on, Christian? Okay, so what's the, what are we okay with? This language or the change that Judith just suggested? The, well, I thought we were looking at the language um, with a suggestion, or now where were we? Uh, yeah, just changing that error and then adopting as is. Okay. My question to clarify, having corrected that, made that editorial change, is everyone comfortable with that language? Yeah. I mean, if we all of a sudden aren't going to allow any building in the flood zone, it's a very dramatic change, of course, for all of South and G Street, right? And up the fissures of some of the creeks. And right. we're not in a position to do that right here, right now. No, it's I can out of our purview anyways. Correct? I'm sorry. Uh, so the, my question, just so I make sure I get this right, is this proposed change to, you know, there's no specific recommendation here, but on the other matters of should we be allowing development in the flood zone, is this going to red or is this going to gray? Red, we're done dealing with it. Gray, we're going to come back to it later. I think we need to come back to it later once we're talking about um, the coastal program and the land use code. That's a vote to come back. Joel? Yeah, personally, I'd like to come back because I'd like more specifics on what the development potential is on those sites in flood zone A who might be impacted another vote for coming back to this Matt or Peter yeah. I'd like to come back okay three to come back Matt uh, I'm gonna vote to come back but I I, I the conversation of, of what is in zone a is like a very large it's like a whole agenda item for a whole meeting pretty much so I, I think I'm voting to come back but in the in the future I guess Okay, and how about this end of the table? Come back or leave as is? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm neutral about the subjects. Um, I feel there's engineering controls around which we can, you know, responsibly develop, whatever that means, responsibly. But, you know, um, you know I don't want to prohibit you know, there's areas where in which there is zone A um, flood zones within our city of Arcadia where in which, you know, it might be in a farming area and if they want to put in like an agricultural building, then we're prohibiting that, um, you know, from developing a farm or whatever they want to do for their purposes and so forth. Um, 
you know, some sort of accessory dwelling or, or some sort of accessory building. Um, so I don't know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty neutral about this one. Dan? Um, I'd rather just leave it alone and I don't feel the need to come back to it, but, um, five others want it back. So it's coming back. Well, maybe we can, um, then put it in the bike rack and can staff possibly in advance of this coming back to the top of the bike rack, um, I don't know, provide a little more information on like what exactly is in that zone. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll make sure that the city engineer is here to, you know, tell you okay. what the details. Then, then let's leave that there and move on to the next other matter. So now we're moving back to the top of other matters without specific language suggestions. Yeah. So telecommunication telecommunications facilities. Who whose was this? I think this was uh, Commissioner Lehman's. Where am I? Uh, PF5D telecommunications oh. facilities. In the old Copeland site. Yeah, it, uh, so this is me being kind of a grumpy old man. Um, <laughs> um, you have that prerogative, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, this section states these facilities shall be screened from view, blah, blah. And the new facility at 11th and M is not screened from view and is ugly and waste a lot of space. And I'm wondering if that can be remedied. Are, are, are you talking about the, the fence or a, a tower? I'm talking about the fact that that facility has that horrible fence and it uses a huge amount of really valuable real estate to do nothing, it just, you know, is a gravel parking lot now with no parking. You, you came on the planning commission just in time to have missed that event. I mean, if there's a question of can there be any, anything can be done, I'm just gonna yeah, guess the answer exactly. is no. That's my question. But what does staff say about that? Um, just real quick. Uh, the fence, uh, the data center is planning on coming in on a, a phase two for their project and we've already uh, let them know that they will be submitting a plan for a new fence at that time. Um, they're fully aware of that. Um, the uh, zoning can be changed. This project was principally permitted because of the type of project it is. So certainly uh, the Planning Commission can take a look at that and decide to, to change those. Um, you know, I think that we have to accept that there are going to be a certain number of these, you know, dead sites, for, for lack of a better word. You know, we've got AT&T up on the hill. You've got the PG&E sites, you know, scattered throughout town. In order to serve the utilities that we need, we need the utility landing facilities that uh, help manage those. And so certainly it's within the Planning Commission's purview to, to amend those codes in the future. Here's a thought. I mean, we heard a comment from the public today that we could use a park in the gateway area. I mean, half that lot, more than half that lot is just empty now. Can they be encouraged to, you know, put a playground there or something? Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to get too sidetracked on this conversation. The answer is no. They won't allow a playground. Um, they also are planning on doing uh, future phases that will take up that space that they've got, the real estate that they've got on that property. Okay, Her grumpy old man comments heard and recorded uh, for the record. Um, I'm not sure what else we can really do with this um, right now, but uh, I think we're all in agreement. Let's hope that the future changes that happen in phases two and on and on and on um, address some of this stuff. Yep. Well, we've already heard that the fence is uh, going to get mediated in the future with phases two or three, which right. is great. Yeah. Which is great. Excellent. And, and, we, and we can thank staff for conveying the community's 
dismay at the way their design has turned out to date. Great. I, Just one more. We're also talking about changing the zoning, right? That's what the gateway plan is. So we're, we're working on, on that too. <laughs> that facility would not be allowed under the gateway plan. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, uh, this next one, uh, General, um, who's, who's that, suggesting that, was this? That was me, and, hey, Judith? and I kind of brought it up um, for discussion because I, I'm assuming that healthcare facilities are addressed somewhere else, um, even though um, they may actually be in areas that are zoned as public facilities. A lot of them are in facilities that aren't zoned as public facilities. There's a kind of a disconnect there between um, our health care facilities and our zoning for historical reasons, but the fact that our public facilities section doesn't um, even mention our health care facilities is a problem to me, and at the very least it seems that um, we could direct the readers to where they will find out about health care facilities. Um, the second part of that um, is asking a question about um, how does the plan address things like uh, charter schools that are operating on property that is not school district property. And we've had a number of issues with them coming up before the Planning Commission um, over the years because those charter schools occupy sort of a of, of an in in between place, um, their their um, their safety and their use is not governed by the same school development state rules that school district schools are, and yet we have an obligation to protect the students in those facilities from bad planning and building decisions. And so I, I'm, I just brought that up because I want to know how our um, public facilities uh, and infrastructure plan should actually address those things that kind of fall through the cracks. Because right now it doesn't address them at all. It doesn't even mention them. Um, just real quick, I think the, um, the land use element actually addresses these in more detail and then public facilities uses are incorporated into our zoning um, the you know you could certainly add some language around this if the commission wants to but the um, infrastructure and public facilities is uh, addressing primarily facilities that the city owns uh, in terms of public facilities but we are required to address fire in that uh, per state law and so that's why the fire department even the the fire district even though it's not a city facility uh, is also addressed so that's just a little bit of the context but if you wanted to add something in addition to what's in there um, you're more than welcome to you might want to look at what's already incorporated in the land use element to, to identify where there are or if there are gaps I asking is that we did address school districts um, th those are addressed um, and then there was their policies about education that is addressed and and yet these things just they they've fallen out so maybe staff can develop some language to at least uh, acknowledge them and direct uh, readers to where in the plan they might find those things addressed because this is where I would expect to see them addressed and so when they're not there I'm wondering why aren't they there? They must be somewhere else. Um, and that will help direct readers to where they are. Okay, so I, I, let me try and say back what I think you're asking for here and make sure I understand it. So if we added into either an existing section or a new section recognizing that public facility zoning allows for hospitals and schools 
and then directed readers to the land use element. That would satisfy your concern? Um, it, it, it might, but then it doesn't address the disconnect between the existence of these facilities and their need to develop and the fact that um, they don't really match up with the zoning. Do, do they, they do match up with the zoning, though. The zoning allows for uh, hospitals, schools. Schools are actually allowed in a lot of different kinds of zones. Um, R right. So, so somewhere, just something in the background or some policy to indicate that they exist and that they're public facilities and that the city recognizes them as such. Is that different from what, I guess, did I not capture what you said the first time when I reiterated? Um, I guess that's why I didn't propose specific language because it, it just seems as though this these are things that have literally fallen through the cracks and gotten no mention so far, um, in including the charter schools that are operating as, in effect, public facilities, educational facilities at any rate, but aren't on land that's actually zoned for public facilities. I, I'm not. I'm not sure how how our plan wants to address them, but I do know that since those issues have come before the commission on more than one occasion, the plan ought to have something to say about them. I'm. I'm not. A, I'm. I'm. Not a hundred percent sure what what we're trying to fix here. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I, I feel like we're. I'm not sure where we go to suggest this um, being different, um, to be honest. Does, does anyone else have a, a, a opinion on the language as it is or a proposed change that might help this discussion? Matt? I'm, I'm also not entirely sure, but I, is it just that there's a list of things that are public facilities and it currently doesn't say hospitals and charter schools and that you want to add those two things or and I want some mention of them even if it's only directing us where to find information about them okay. let me let me try one more time what I thought I heard and what I feel like I heard you say again and then what I thought I heard you say for the third time which sounded real similar to what I said but you seem to say that I didn't hear what you said so I'm gonna give it one more try and have you confirm that this is in fact, what you'd like to have happen, and I think we can find some language around it. We should mention in the public facilities uh, element either an existing section where it's discussing these other non-city public facilities or in a new section, hospitals, schools, and other things that are typically thought of as public gathering spaces, facilities, and then direct the reader to the land use element where they're addressed. That sounds to me like what that's we're talking about. That's That sounds good. And so I'd, okay. I'd, so I'd ask staff to develop that language and figure out where to put it. Okay. Let's, I think let's we can put a that. full stop on that conversation um, unless someone else has something to add to it before we move forward. Okay. Let's, let's wrap that and then just a time check, we're about maybe 25 minutes or so out from um, putting a pause on some of the bike rack stuff and moving into uh, approval of the general plan annual progress report. So another 25 minutes or so. Can you put us on to the next item, David? Yep. Oops. Okay, I think this was already addressed. Uh, I think everybody conceded to this point. Yes. I think those three things were all sort of editing things that I had suggested about where to move things so that they made more sense. Um. 
it's we just covered four, right? Is that what you're saying? We number four up there, we kind of just covered, right? Like the staff will add some language about what's to, not in the public. To my mind, we we covered four. Yeah, in so, our previous discussion. Yeah, we okay. covered four and okay. five and five and five. Okay. Um, so five. Uh, related to the order of things, um, edu I, th I think it was referring to education and stuff just to put um, that sanitation related infrastructure all together and then not put the sort of institutional infrastructure in the middle. Um, literally. All in favor? Anyone have a problem with that? No. Okay, let's do I it. We can do that. Okay. <laughs> Item six. Yeah, that's These are, that's another editing thing. Just if you're referring to another plan, um, let, let us know when the plan was adopted or last amended and then if you're amending that element, you can update when those plans were most recently amended at that time. It looks to me like it's item six, seven, and eight are all editing formatting Yeah, they're, they're all editing things. They're not policy things. S does anyone have a problem with six, seven, and eight as they're written? Okay, so let's take six, um, seven, and eight. Yeah, and, and I, I guess I would just say for, for editing things, I mean, in general, you know, there's some <clears throat> formatting things that are, you know, going to change. I, we're going to try and go through the document. We are going to go through the document, not going to try. We're going to actually go through the document and uh, remove reference to um, things that will be dated um, and instead try and point towards programs or, or, you know, planning efforts that are amended from time to time as opposed to the specific document. Um, cause that, um, so I think with all these, uh, I did, I'm sorry, I didn't re read these in, in, in fine enough detail, I guess, to recognize these are just editorial comments. I, I would suggest we skip to the policy comments. Agreed. Okay, I mean, gonna, I would think really as we're trying to make policy level recommendations to the city council, we should try to avoid, um, too much editing stuff because it's going to get cleaned up. Um, or certainly has another opportunity or four to get cleaned up before made final. And um, I feel like we can have the most impact um, by making recommendations that uh, affect policy. And I realize sometimes the change of a, a word can absolutely do that. Okay, so we're up to 12. Okay, so that I feel that like was we covered this. Uh, the PF4. Don't stand the section between. That also refers to um, coordinating with Cal Poly um, with regard especially to the last part to city services the previous part is actually um, putting a broader objective in there rather than just this sort of narrow mechanical one. And I have to apologize, Commissioner Mayor. I, I again didn't recognize that there were specific policy language changes here. I thought this was the track changes from the original document and I couldn't identify in the time that I was working on this that you had made this change. This, this should have b belonged in the uh, policy pitch area maybe. Um, it, it, it's fine. I mean, it, it's just, you know, the editor in me edits <laughs> and changes words. So. I think this broadly looks fine. Does anyone have a concern with any of this language? Then let's keep moving. Okay, let's see. Uh, the PF4A, which was below that, was to add mention of the high school district which had been left out do you call 
call that call that gold? <laughs> Brown? I didn't Brownish know what gold. It is. In, it's interesting. Copper. I didn't know Copper. what to call it. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. I lost the uh, the last. Oh, PF4A. Yeah, it was to add mention of the high school, the charter schools. All agreed. Okay. Uh, number thirteen, PF six A. There, there's a lot of stuff in the in the the zero waste section that has lots of detail that I don't think really necessarily belongs in a general plan. Um, and it, it's all good stuff, but it's not really general plan material. And in particular, stuff like examples of effective source reduction and reuse activities that shall be promoted. Um, those things were all private actions except for the last one. Um, and, and they're great, but they're, they don't give direction to the city um, in a way that is super useful. And there's some great background in the um, zero waste section, but we need to remember that the plan is actually looking forward rather than looking backward. Um, and, and so it seems like we can kind of cut to the chase with regard to policies on some of those things. So there were a number of items along those lines. So is your proposal to delete everything except for number nine? Um, uh, that would make me happy, but it, you know, if the zero waste people would feel like we're dissing them by eliminating them, then, then you know, we don't want to diss anyone. This keyboard is chunky. Okay. Oh, dang it, it did it again. I haven't vetted this with the Environmental Services Department. If you all want to delete it, um, I would say that I'm going to have to check in with them as to what we do with it. This may be one of those policies that they say we're going to keep it. So, yeah. let's let's leave it gray and put it back in the bike rack. Matt, yeah, and, did you want to say something? And again, if it, if it's going to make someone feel bad that we're deleting their examples, then sure. So I, I hadn't looked at this language closely until just now, but the it, the prelude there is the city shall promote these sorts of actions, right? So it, it is, they are individual actions, but the policy is about the city telling people to do them, which is more of a city thing. Mm. And so that I, I, I don't see what the... Right, but Hold on. I like in, to in an economy of words, um, there, there's this big long list and given the types of things that we've cut out because it's saying too much, those are examples of Go ahead, that Joel. are going to seem quaint by 2045. Well, it may be, but it's, it's in the plan now. It, I don't see any harm keeping it in there. I think it's, it's good you know, if anybody from the public ever reads a general plan and wants to you know, get an idea of how to, what effective source reduction activities are, they could read it and, and do it or not do it, but it's, it's there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's there and uh, it's useful and just leave it there. Two votes for leaving it. Anybody else? Uh, you know, I like the idea of 
challenging environmental services to see if it's all still up to date, but that's on them. I, I think we should have it in there. I'm fine with it. Christian? <laughs> uh, I'm neutral. Matt, Matt? I would just leave it in. Okay, so let's let's just leave that alone. Fourteen. So that's me. Um, I read this: a goal of achieving ninety percent landfill diversion by twenty twenty seven, and that seemed like a very difficult goal. Um, I ask, is it realistic? Realistic? Do we want to claim that? I, I, I personally don't think we have a chance of getting there. Keep, keep the faith, Peter. I mean, uh, how, how about if I, uh, how about if I say ES can verify and update the date? Because I'm sure we're going to try and have a goal to reduce uh, by ninety percent. When, when was the base year for that ninety percent? Probably, I don't know. Probably I, I two thousand eight. I think it was several years ago, and and that this this, this kind of goes back several years, and we've already diverted a whole lot. Well, uh, well say again, we, David, your proposal. I would, yeah, I would suggest uh, putting this in the bike rack. Uh, ES can come back and report report to you on this. We'll probably wind up making a change uh, to the date based on whatever they whatever their feedback is. Well, let me ask, do we need a date or do we need a goal? Um, yeah, Joe's, Joe's, go ahead, Joe. We're mandated by the state to reduce our waste and then when they add new legislation like uh, their organic waste. So I think we're trying to, to um, meet those standards and have policies in place that will help us achieve that. And some of this might even be required by state law that we have it in the general plan. Um, so I know that, you know, I think that it's a good idea to have these questions for environmental services. Um, but yeah, I think it's. Go ahead, Christian. Yeah, can we just revert to the, I, I, unless this is like an embetterment clause or something like that, you know, um, can we just revert to, you know, state laws and requirements for, for, you know, reduction or diversion of waste to landfills? Yeah, again, I'm, uh, this is not my area of expertise. I'm going to have to have ES weigh in on, that's a, that's on a, this. That's a question for yeah. ES. Yep. Um, Are you and okay then with for 1383, again, I'm going to have ES come and talk to you about that. Yes, we're complying with it. It's state law we're required to. I, I, I would just hold it. I, I mean, are we saying that we're gonna, I, what it says in the law is 20% of edible food will be recovered uh, by 2025. So it's two years from now. And I don't see any being recovered now. So is it realistic? Um, we are working with um, our partners in the region to come up with a plan to meet AB 1383 waste diversion requirements. As you said, it's a law and we're going to comply with it. Go ahead, Judith. Yeah, I, I think basically anything that, that's already in the zero waste action plan, um, I, I wouldn't want to change in the general plan. Um, before going back to that basis in the, the um, even though it's a subsidiary plan, it, it is something that a lot of thought has gone into. And some of the dates in here are state mandated. And it seems like, um, you know, reiterating the state mandated dates for right now might make sense as implementation measures. Um, especially if we think we're going to miss those dates. Is everyone okay with having uh, environmental services update on both of these and moving on to the next question? Okay. Let's move to 16. That was my uh, editorial suggestion. I don't remember what PF1A said, but this phrase seemed to be out of place. She'll continue. 
you said uh, striking though the city is well within its water allotment. Yeah. That didn't seem necessary. It seemed like the city was kind of bragging about um, being well within its water allotment. And so what? It, it doesn't affect the overall statement. No concerns from staff. Does anyone have an issue with changing that language? Then let's adopt it and move on. That was just, I think, a typo in uh, number 17. Um, if, if you look at those uh, percentages, they go in um, discrete intervals and this interval just seemed out of play. It, it seemed like um, somebody um, saw 30% and um, or saw 70% and subtracted it from 100 to get 30. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, well, I saw that same box in the, my notes here. I was utterly confused by that table. So I think it bears, there's a table on the page that shows right. percentages and the, it's a little bit screwy, at least the way I looked at it. So this box here? Right. Uh, let's see. Uh, paragraph number three, I think, kind of seems out of order with some of the, what, the numbers were de descending and then right. that 30%, yeah. It went 90, 80, 30, 60. So obviously the 30 should be 70, not 30. I'm, I'm wondering if that's stuff that we can refer to another policy with without actually having that particular chart in the general plan because those numbers are going to change over the years, I suspect. And if we can refer to the policy on which it's based um, and, and not confuse our general plan readers, um, that might actually help us out a lot especially um, since it's a water district policy and not our own policy. I, I think that would actually be more useful because, um, you know, it could be even in a hyperlinked version of this, there can be a hyperlink to the water district's policy. No, I, I, Staff I totally, <clears throat> totally agree with you. Uh, we should strike this table entirely and just refer to the. Uh, w which gets to the issue of those those insert boxes that don't go all the way across the page. When when you're reading the digital version of this on different platforms, those boxes get really kind of s sort of messed up. Is everyone okay with ditching that box and making? Okay, let's do that. Okay, What's so this is associated with? One, I don't know, it's on 2 80. I'll just make note of that. Okay, so delete the box. To P PF 1 dash 1 C. Okay. But can you still refer to the water district policy? document nope somewhere no nope. <laughs> no i'm joking yes of course okay great 17 that was that's 17. noted yeah so awesome as they, much they fun said they said it couldn't be done <laughs> they were wrong um so 
as much fun as that was, um, our next agenda item is to recommend approval of the 2022 general plan annual progress report. Can we begin with a staff report, please? Yeah, um, thank you for uh, your work on that last agenda item, everyone. That was um, that was a lot, and I appreciate everyone's diligence uh, working through it. Uh, so I'm going to be really brief here and uh, defer to any questions that you might have and just offer that you uh, would adopt resolution uh, PC, number PC2302. Uh, um, this is the city's annual uh performance report related to its general plan. Uh, it essentially allows us to tell the state how well we think we're doing um, at meeting the goals of the general plan. As the staff report states, there's no specific format. Uh, we've changed the format a couple of times. The last time you may recall, this was a very lengthy report. We tried to streamline it and talk about you know specific sections. I think DLO looked to uh, some other uh, jurisdiction. So if you have any questions about uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, the report or the detail that's in it, I'd be happy to, to answer those. Um, the one item I did want to point out to you, bring your attention to is on packet page 105, where we relate our housing element uh, reporting progress. This is an excerpt of the housing element annual report that we're required to provide to HCD, the Housing Community Development Agency, um, annually. But I just wanted to point out that um, number one, we had a stellar uh, 2022, did 175 permits. A lot of that was related to the home key projects. Uh, and number two, that we uh, have nearly completed all of our very low and low income housing. So if you look to the far right of that uh, table, you'll see that um, we have almost no remaining regional housing needs allocation or RENA. Um, we are unlikely uh, to uh, to meet our requirements for the above moderate um, because we just don't have land appropriately zoned for above moderate for 208 units. Um, but we're gonna, we're, we're doing pretty well at meeting our objectives, this, this uh, housing element policy, largely because of those home key projects. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'd ask that you adopt the resolution for your recommendation on the city council, adopt this and submit it. I. This is less of a question and more just an editorialization on RENA numbers, which is that people often talk about them as like, once we meet these, all of our problems are solved. Uh, whereas I, I think of them as like an absolute bare minimum that often is a poor guess by the state of what a jurisdiction needs. Uh, and I just wanted to bring that up. Well, I'm happy we're, we're meeting them. That's great. I just, it's, it's one target, but it's not the target. For the record. Okay, does anyone else have any questions for staff? Or can we get a motion to adopt resolution number PC2302? So move. We got a second, we have a motion. I'll second. Motion and a second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, thank you very much for that. We're now moving on to correspondence and communications. Do we have any correspondence from Planning Commission members? Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, two questions to leave you all with. Um, one is um, doing design review on a project feels uh, out of place in these times of trying to keep costs low and streamlining people's ability to build homes. Uh, it's great to see what's being presented to us. I always enjoy to see what people are building. However, that it's just because it's in this neighborhood conservation area, which I happen to live in, and I think it's nice. She's adding a nice house to the neighborhood. I appreciate that. But it sure strikes me um, that there's a whole bunch of other parts of Arcata that they don't have to go through that scrutiny. They just go to the city and get a permit, and it doesn't come through us. And I uh, don't pretend that we're going to tackle this right now. I just wanted to plant to see that this seems out of place in these days of trying to streamline all processes through the city. I'm sure it cost them a two or $3,000 extra on their project between applying for a uh, opportunity to appeal to us, as well as staff time to type all that report up and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, so that's one item. The other is I'm, I keep hearing from the public that they want to know that they're being heard. And um, I know sometimes at the end of public comment, commissioners respond to certain things that were said. And I'm just wondering if how we all feel about that. And we don't, I don't, I'm not trying to start a big conversation, but it uh, sometimes feels to me like maybe we should just say things more often directly responding to people that are kind of calling us out for apparently not, you know, discussing their agenda topic or their, you know, grievance that they're bringing up over and over and over and they're not feeling heard. Um, so I, I don't quite know how to remedy this thing. I just feel like maybe there just needs to be a little bit more communication between us and them. And at the end of public comment, we have the opportunity to do so. We don't choose to, usually. Sometimes we do. Um, anyway, that's, that's all. I think you bring up a, a, a great point. Um, and I struggle with this as well. Um, we listen to public comment. We read um, letters from um, constituents that write into us. Um, we get a variety of information from the public. Um, I know some people feel that, or my sense is that some people repeatedly make the same comment. And when they don't see what they want enacted, their assumption is that public comment is not being heard. I understand why people feel that way, but my personal take on this is that the process is messy and involves compromise for everyone. And so while some people are getting, giving comment and not having their comments heard, for almost every issue, there are other people that have made the opposite comment and probably don't feel the same way. So um, I, I, I think part of what I'm saying is I, I feel like it's inherent in the process uh, of trying to come to a compromise as a community over issues that people are going to feel um, unheard when they don't feel like their specific viewpoint is catching traction. That, that's how I look at it. Um, but again, I always think there's other people whose viewpoints are getting traction. As far as um, interacting with people during public comment, um, I think that's important, but I think it could also stretch public comment out and sometimes it's sort of a judgment call as to whether it's a productive conversation or not and, and that's just kind of case by case and I, I can't think of a really a specific way to view it other than that. Yeah, Dan, my question to you is who would respond, you know, which individual would respond and would it be a statement that is the, the statement of a group and, and you, for example, would be the spokesperson? Or is it your personal comment? It, it, it would obviously, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry, I just wanted to interject with a point of order. The communications are intended to be brief comments uh, to inform, not necessarily a deliberation. I can agendize this if you all want to have a more uh, full discussion about it. Um, I think it's a really good point and I hate to squelch the conversation because I think it's a good one. Um, but I think that we're, we're outside the bounds of our form here. Thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate the observation. Um, any correspondence from staff this evening? Uh, just that we'll, uh, just a reminder that we'll be meeting back here at 5.30 on Thursday, the 27th, uh, to start out with the uh, land use element in particular the uh, land use designations map and the amendments there too. And then um, we'll be moving into the circulation element, bike rack. Um, so just a remind, reminder to you and all those out there in uh, TV land. Great, thanks for that. There being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Yeah.